Hi, I'm Dorian Grilly, Executive Director of the Bicycle Alliance of Minnesota. Welcome to our Minnesota Bike Walk Summit. It was too windy at the Capitol, so welcome to my home office. First, I want to thank the Bikeman staff for their help producing this event and our speakers for taking the time to share their active transportation goals, strategies, and messages. Please share your name and where you're from in the chat box. You can also use the chat box to ask questions of our live speakers at the beginning and end of the program. And if you have any questions during the videos, please ask and we'll try to answer them in the chat. And feel free to share and answer yourself if you're familiar with the subject. And finally, please keep yourself on mute. After the program, please grab a green beer and some snacks and join us for happy hour. We'll have some trivia questions and be there to answer additional questions. The coronavirus pandemic has changed our lives and work in so many ways, many of them too terrible to think about. We here at Bike Men are so sorry for those of you who have lost friends and family members and for all who have lost jobs and are still unemployed. But there have also been positives for advocates for biking and walking, public health and the environment. People are simply biking and walking more. And there are some other big changes in the works. I wasn't surprised with Target's announcement last week that they have found that having employees work from home was a net positive for productivity and that they'll be closing quite a few offices in downtown Minneapolis. I also wasn't surprised that the American Rescue Plan passed last week included a ton of money for state and local governments and schools and was delighted to hear that it would more or less be up to us to decide how to spend it. More on that later. We all know that people are walking and biking more than ever. It's up to us to communicate the co-benefits of that and that investing in active transportation, infrastructure and programs are win-win strategies for our state, its communities and schools and our collective health and our environment. You only have to look out your window, ask a bike shop owner or tr try to buy an e-bike to see that the demand for biking and walking has never been higher. We need to keep saying that over and over. We all know that biking and walking are not the only solution to these challenges, but the return on investment is high. I've always thought that the most important part of my job is to help our supporters with the tools and knowledge to be more effective advocates at the state, local, and national levels. To that end, we have a great program for you. We'll start live with the Commissioner of Transportation and close with our legislative champions. In between, we'll have some great videos, including ones from Washington, D.C. and Finland. There are several others that are intended to help you with your messages and strategies related to active transportation and, and communicating those with your state and local leaders. With that, I'd like to welcome Margaret Anderson Kelleher, the Commissioner of Transportation for the last couple of years. We should all consider her our friend. She recently bought an e-bike from one of our, our biggest supporters, Eric's Bike Shop. It was an honor for me to be appointed by her to serve on the MnDOT Sustainable Transportation Advisory Council, which she co-chairs with Chris Clark from the CEO of Excel Energy. She previously served in the Minnesota House of Representatives for 12 years, including four years as Speaker of the House. She's a graduate of Gustavus Adolphus College and the Harvard Kennedy School. We really are focused right now at MnDOT at uh, working with the governor's budget in some key strategic areas, equity contracting, uh, a doubling of the uh, size of the Office of Sustainability and Public Health at MnDOT, where a lot of the work of the staff is happening. And we also are very focused on climate issues in the, within MnDOT through the governor's budget. And the governor's made a number of recommendations for increased funding that will help us uh, be able to both increase resiliency of infrastructure and to uh, continue the work that we've been talking about with the stack, because that is also really important in terms of the climate. I'm very optimistic about Secretary Buttigieg 
and uh, acting, uh, the acting administrators, including acting administrator of the Federal Highway Administration, Stephanie Pollack, who I worked with a little bit when she was leading uh, the Massachusetts Department of Transportation. She also has experience leading a major transit organization as well, and is a big believer in making sure that communities are getting what they need on the, the bike and walkability side of things. So I'm excited to see how this changes, uh, what we had seen from the last uh, previous four years. And we're working very closely to give information uh, to USDOT right now about the things that we see as priorities. You know, the future uh, of our system is really about connecting people, connecting people to the people they love, connecting people to the work they do, connecting people to the communities and the resources they need to get to. And what we envision in the future is having those connections happen in the most sustainable way possible. And I think the work that you're all doing as advocates for biking and walking is really important. You know, we occasionally have some headwinds at the legislature, people who don't think MnDOT should spend a dime on uh, active transportation. And I, I think that we have been very effective advocates to fight back against that. And I'm not shy about that. Uh, I'm, I think that we have, we have needs as well and making sure that communities are connected safely and equitably is very important. So I wanna thank you for your advocacy. Um, I started my career as a community organizer. And so I have great appreciation for those who are pushing the system and uh, pushing people to, to go further. So thank you. And I am, uh, uh, you know, available to take a couple questions. I, I opened up the chat here and I'm seeing, I'm getting caught up. Um, uh, Rachel, you're right. A lot of people are out walking, a lot of people out using parks. I think, you know, making sure that, that folks who are riding bikes are next. I, it makes me so happy. I have a park across the street from me. I've never seen that park busier than it has been in the last year, all season long, like every season. And um, even lots of lots of little little kids getting out there on their push bikes where their feet are on the ground and they're they don't even have pedals yet. It's been super exciting, of course, up until the snow. But uh, they'll be back. Let me ask you one question that was in the chat box, and I'm going to make it more generic than Highway 14 west of Rochester. But how do people get involved in uh, local projects? Um, they're concerned about uh, making sure there's good pedestrian and bike crossing and access along those. And MnDOT's planning process is sometimes so confusing because it's, it's years out. <laughs> yes, it confuses even legislators, that's for sure. And so one of the things, um, so first of all, the, the first thing to do is to seek out through the MnDOT website the district you live in and make contact with that district engineer. So down in that area of Highway 14, it's Mark Schoenfelder. You probably know that already. Marty is my guess. Uh, but you know, being in contact with Mark, who can put you in contact with the project team, would be very important in any of these projects. I think that uh, our planning is done on that more local level. And even though you do occasionally hear about at the legislature, a big project, the project behind me in the picture is the Highway 53 bridge uh, up on the range, actually MnDOT's tallest bridge uh, named for one of the shortest legislators who ever served one of the powerhouses, Tom Rukavina. And you know that bridge had to have some special funding to it because it actually has a very wide uh, walkway pathway alongside of it. It, it is for multi, multiple forms of recreation to go alongside of it. And we couldn't pay for that with 
the trunk highway dollars, we needed something else, uh, partly because the one of the reasons is snowmobiles can go over and ATVs can go over it as well. If it were biking and walking, we could have paid for it. Uh, so I share that with you because most decisions are coming through the local uh, Area Transportation Plan Project, or ATP. And, you know, now's the time to start getting involved. And one of the things that uh, I would share with you that MnDOT is doing is really trying to engage constituencies much, much earlier in projects. Um, we, you know, and I, I will just say, uh, we are really trying not to be the MnDOT of the past that would come to a, to a community and say, this is how it is, and not, not this is the plan. It's more a joint or a uh, co-designed effort in a lot of cases. So I will also talk to Mark about what's happening on Highway 14 west of Rochester, that piece that is actually under construction now and, and, and learn a little more about it. And you're certainly welcome to contact me as well. Great. Well, you know, thank you so much for taking the time on this very busy day um, to be with us, Commissioner. And uh, uh, we will we will most certainly stay in touch. And thanks for your support of active transportation. So, thank you very much. And I hope to see you out there on the trails, walking and biking. Yeah. Have a good evening. Yeah. Thanks. Take care. So and and we all keep promise to keep up with the MnDOT staff. Uh, uh, to make sure that Minnesota is a continues to become a better place to bike and walk. Um, next, I'd really, I really, really want to welcome all of our speakers at once and thank them again for taking the time to record what you're going to find as a collection of truly, truly amazing videos. Um, I won't introduce I won't introduce the rest of them, but we're going to start with Charlie Zelli, the chair of the Metropolitan Council, and we'll see you all uh, in a little over an hour. Hello, everyone. My name is Bill Nesper, and I'm the executive director of the League of American Bicyclists. And I'm Karen Whitaker, the deputy executive director of the League. We appreciate Dorian and the Bicycle Alliance of Minnesota for inviting us to join you for a few minutes at your 2021 virtual Minnesota Bike Walk Summit to give you an update from our work at the National Bike Summit, which just happened here in Washington, D.C. a week ago. For those of you who don't know us, the League since 1880 has been the national organization protecting the rights of people who bike and promoting bicycling for transportation, good health, and the joy and freedom it brings. We know that bi the bicycle isn't just the best vehicle ever invented and almost guaranteed to make you happy. Bicycling is part of the solution to many of the challenges we face in our communities, country, and world. It's our vehicle for change. And that was the theme of this year's summit. One of the league's roles is representing you and amplifying the needs of people biking to Congress and to the administration. The National Bike Summit for over 20 years has been the annual meeting of biking advocates, educators, business owners, and local stakeholders, all working to share best practices for local action and speak with one voice on Capitol Hill. This summit was all online and was the largest and most accessible summit ever with more than 1100 people from around the country sharing best practices, listening and learning and representing the people of their home communities and states in breakout sessions and on Capitol Hill. While we're not able to be together in person and weren't able to be at the National Bike Summit in person, we're working together and riding together because we believe that everyone should have access to safe and comfortable biking and access through biking to go to, to get to the places that they want to go. We believe that everyone should have a real opportunity to bike for transportation, for well-being, and the pure joy of it, no matter their income level, their neighborhood, their race, or their age or ability. Right now, we are in a moment where momentum is critical. If we work together to keep up that momentum of the bike boom and to build back better, we can really build back bicycle friendly. To build back bicycle friendly, we have to focus on building political will. We know the keys to building bicycle-friendly communities and a bicycle-friendly America and a bicycle-friendly Minnesota. From great biking networks to on-bike education to offering more opportunities to bike and putting equity, diversity, and inclusion at the center of our work. We need decision makers from here in Washington and to your city councils to act. We see what happens when advocates like you create political will, actions and investments in better biking, improve lives and communities, and not just for people biking. 
In Washington, we have a historic opportunity with both a wide ranging transportation bill due this year and new leadership, both in Congress and the administration. Our new Secretary of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg, says he wants our transportation system to be more people centric than auto centric. And congressional leaders are insisting that we use our transportation investments to address climate change. To make the most of this, we'll take regular and consistent outreach to Congress to ensure bicycling and walking are part of the climate solution, that we are building complete streets to accommodate everyone, and that safe bicycling and walking are integral to transportation investments and plans, and not an afterthought. We had a great start this year at the summit with 550 people attending roughly 330 congressional meetings. And we'll need your help moving forward. So please watch for updates from the Bike League and Bicycle Alliance of Minnesota. The Bike League is prioritizing the transportation bill in Congress this year, because that is happening right now. But we also have plans to work with the administration to integrate bicycling and walking safety and access into everything they do. And we're keeping tabs on a possible stimulus bill and other potential opportunities. For more on our priorities this year, please check out our blog at bikeleague.org backslash blog. To learn more about what happened at the summit, you can watch the summit plenaries and keynote speeches on the Bike League YouTube channel, including speeches from both chair people of these two most important committees, a speech on arrested mobility by Charles T. Brown, a virtual tour of Deft, the Netherlands with Melissa and Chris Bruntlett, and US Transportation Secretary, Pete Buttigieg. Please check those out. Thank you for all the work you're doing to make bicycling safe, comfortable, and accessible to all of your communities through Minnesota and riding with us at the League to build a bicycle-friendly America for everyone. Welcome to Finland. Our Finnish cycling embassy ambassadors will take us to Turku, Oulu, and to Helsinki, the capital city which sits at the same latitude as Anchorage, Alaska. In the last 10 years or so, Helsinki has grown its cycling mode share to over 10% through much investment and serious political will. We have created this film during the winter and the COVID pandemic. Hence, you will see fewer cyclists than are normally out and about in Finnish cities. We are fond of saying, if you want to be inspired, go to Copenhagen or to many cities in the Netherlands. If you want help increasing your city's mode share, we can help through information exchanges, or through partnerships. Us Finnish people are well known for our humble nature. But despite of that fact, we at the city of Helsinki have set a very ambitious goal of becoming the most functional city in the world. That of course requires a very multidisciplinary and a comprehensive approach. It's based on a well-established fabric of developing our dense and mixed land use further and having all corners of our urban fabric connected by a trunk network of light rapid transit. This light rapid transit is further complemented by a comprehensive, continuous and a coherent citywide network for cycling. On a transport level, this means separating bicycle traffic on all busy thoroughfares for car traffic and also separating from pedestrians and then practicing traffic calming on local streets so that people of all ages and abilities will feel safe and comfortable cycling on the road. Oulu, a northern Finnish city with a population of over 100,000, enjoys the moniker Winter Biking Capital. Oulu sees a summertime bicycling mode share of 28% and it only drops to 22% in the winter. Oulu has a connected network of facilities from shared use pathways to dedicated grade separated cycling tracks. They are now famous for their winter maintenance programs and techniques and cities from all over the north are beginning to implement the Oulu methods. At the Metsukonga school, 1,000 of the 1,200 elementary age students ride their bikes to work every day, most often in the dark. This gives a whole new meaning to safe routes to school. Often during the winter months, wayfinding and identifiers are obscured by ice and snow. Projecting images onto the snow has been a clever fix in Oulu. 
The city of Helsinki understands that cycling is good business. Each euro of investment in infrastructure yields eight euros of return. Dri Kakalio. Beginning in 2012, the Helsinki region has embarked on a program to develop a network of bicycle highways, so-called Barna routes. While the investment in this network has and continues to be significant, the return has been significant. For every one euro invested, there has been return of eight euros. This return primarily affects healthcare costs, which to be fair, are government funded. This represents almost 50% of the return. Travel time saved about 20%, with environmental savings about 8%. There are costs associated as well, including maintenance and the cost of car crashes. In the US, of course, single-payer insurance does not yet exist. This doesn't mean that healthcare insurers won't benefit from the development of bicycle infrastructure. They will. It just remains outside of the ROI equation for their U.S. market. But what if the health insurance industry participated in the investment? Not to the tune of 50%, but what about half of that? The benefit and the ROI is there. It's just a question of who will invest and who will get the return. The city of Turku has become a leader in mobility as a service. Stella Aaltonen. Maaseudun liikkuminen palveluna mobility as a service tarkoittaa sitä, että käyttäjä saisi mahdollisimman yksinkertaisesti ja helposti moninaisia liikkumisvälineitä käyttöönsä. Turussa on työstetty paljonkin sitä lippuintegraatiota eli taustajärjestelmää. Meidän ensimmäinen tämmöinen lipputaustan integraatio on ollut meidän kaupunkipyöräjärjestelmämme, jossa pystytään sitten Fölin eli seudullisen joukkoliikenteen asiakkuudella käyttämään kaupunkipyöräjärjestelmää ja jos sulla on kuukauden käyttöoikeus joukkoliikenteeseen, niin sä pystyt käyttämään kaupunkipyörä siinä samalla. Mitä me Turussa on hyvin paljon työstetty on sitä, että me päästään yhdistämään niitä kulkuvälineitä itse siihen palvelun tarjontaan. Ja tässä nyt hyvänä esimerkkinä on teatterilippu tai konserttilippu tai tapahtumalippu, joka pystyy yhdistämään joukkoliikenteeseen kertalippu hyvin yksinkertaisesti. Ja se toimiikin nykyisin jo aika isossa osassa meidän, meidän kulttuuripuolen tarjontaa. Turussa liikenteen ja liikkumisen kaikki toimenpiteet tähtää Turun kaupungin hiilineutraalioon vuoteen 2029 mennessä. Liikkuminen palveluna on yksi kokonaisuus, jolla pystytään vauhdittamaan sitä, että asukkaat ja vierailijat pystyisivät mahdollisimman helposti ja yksinkertaisesti käyttämään sellaisia kestäviä kulkuvälineitä, jotka he kuhunkin tavoitteeseen tarkoitukseen tarvitsevat sillä hetkellä. This Google Map graphic shows an interesting comparison of the identified bikeways in Minneapolis and in Helsinki. To be fair, much of the network outside the Helsinki city network is shared, but still off street. When networks can gain this kind of density and connectedness, mode share will follow. It's a good example of, if you build it, they will come. Put into place several years ago, the Helsinki Bike Share program has been wildly successful with over 61,000 annual subscribers. The program is widely used by tourists and locals alike for commuting, tourism, and travel to local events. The financial scheme allows for a successful and growing network while there is pressure to the contrary, the system is closed in the winter months from November through March. Boulevardi and Hementia are sort of bookends in the Helsinki bike ecosystem. Both are well used east west routes. Boulevardi is one of the first, and Hementia is brand new, unfinished as of this filming. Oskari Kaupimäki. Boulevardi, or Boulevard in English, features the first known urban cycle paths in Helsinki, a first real attempt at integrating the bicycle into the urban fabric in Helsinki. Considering that it was built back in 1986, the cycle paths really do represent a lot of promising features of best practices. They're unidirectional on both sides of the street, they're separated from car traffic and pedestrians, and they even feature bicycle-specific traffic signals. Unfortunately, these cycle tracks are hopelessly too narrow, overgrown with vegetation, impossible to maintain, and separation with pedestrians is minimal at intersections. And even if you, if you think that, well, you can fit your bike in there, just consider riding through these cycle tracks with a fully loaded cargo bike. Yikes. Fast tracking from 1986 to 2021, Hamantia really showcases the great leap we have taken with integrating the bicycle into the urban fabric. 
while before the street was a great example of the 1970s car-centric approach, it's now been turned into a living street, a street for people, where the bicycle has also been giving its adequate space with unidirectional great separated cycle tracks on both sides of the street. Before, naysayers said they wouldn't fit, but as you can see, they fit perfectly. This is really a cause for celebration, so cheers and thank you. Cycling in Finland has grown in large part from strong political support. We even have the obligatory image of our Prime Minister, Sanna Marin, on her bike. Again, Oskari Kaupinmäki. Now it's time to talk about everyone's favorite subject, politics. It's very important to realize that no matter how many driven professionals you have working in urban development, a lot of that work will go in vain if there's no political will working in the background as a driving force. That's really what set wheels into motion here in Helsinki. Already before 2012, when the first coherent and continuous target network for cycling was accept accepted by the city board. There was actually a lot of political force already in motion before 2010, and that really started turning into a reality in terms of sustainable development goals starting in 2012. What soon followed the target network was the first multidisciplinary holistic bicycle action plan back in 2013. What that set into motion was really including cycling as an integral part of many strategic plans that followed, which included the mobility plan, uh, the carbon neutral Helsinki plan and the city strategy. As all these different political decisions were made, in the level of investments also rose, starting at around 4 million euros back in 2012, going up to about 10 million euros in 2015, and finally going up to almost 20 million euros in 2020. And it's set to stay at that level until the unforeseen future. And it is with this level of investment that we have the uh, actual chance of making the target network a reality by 2030. And with that, the model share going up to 20%. In 1940, Helsinki enjoyed a 30% mode share for cycling. As the car culture grew, the city systematically lost share to the car and to transit. Over the last 20 years, as a result of high levels of investment, mode share numbers have been climbing. The dip in the last couple of years is partially caused by the dramatic growth in the Helsinki population. Still, the city is not resting on their laurels and have increased investments in cycling infrastructure to about 20 million euros per year. The city also commissioned a new comprehensive 2020 to 2025 bicycle action plan, which identifies a desired growth in mode share to 20% by 2030. Hello, my name is Rich Tower. I'm president of Quality Bicycle Products, headquartered in Bloomington, Minnesota, where we employ almost 500 of our 800 plus employees. We're proud members of the Bicycle Alliance of Minnesota and a platinum bicycle friendly business since 2009, thanks to our commuter program that encourages and rewards employees for using alternative transportation methods to travel to and from work. Since the pandemic started, demand for bikes has been the strongest it's ever been, and we expect that trend to continue for many months to come. Minnesotans are riding bikes in a variety of ways, from toddlers on balance bikes, to kids learning to ride a two-wheeler during recess of their virtual learning, riders experiencing the thrill of mountain biking, or seniors embracing e-bikes as a new mode of transportation. QBP and its partners are working hard to ensure that we're helping to keep people riding well beyond the pandemic and into the future so they can continue to experience the joy and health benefits riding bikes provides in a safe, convenient, and fun way. In Minnesota alone, we partner with more than 200 bike shops, a dozen brand suppliers, and over 25 bicycle-focused nonprofits to help give more people an opportunity to create experiences with bikes. 
regional retailers such as Free Will Bike, Eric's Bike Shop, and Now Bikes and Fitness are among some of the best specialty bicycle retailers in the country. The infrastructure we have in place here in Minnesota that offers riders of all skills and abilities to experience bikes safely plays an enormous role in why these businesses continue to thrive and why Minnesota often ranks among the top as a bike friendly state. On behalf of Quality Bicycle Products, I'd like to thank all the attendees that are helping to lobby for the funding and policy updates being proposed by the Bicycle Alliance of Minnesota. In addition, I'd like to say thank you to the active transportation professionals that help to implement the programs and infrastructure that are making it more convenient, safe, and fun to travel by bike or on foot. Thanks, Dorian. With prime biking season just around the corner in Fergus Falls and the rest of Minnesota, we're excited to start 30 Days of Biking in April, and we're looking forward to National Bike Month in May. We're thrilled to have so many bicycle-friendly businesses in Fergus Falls. It's an honor to be on the League of American Bicyclists' Top 10 BFB list, just above Seattle and right behind Portland and Washington, D.C. Some examples of local BFBs include places like Union Pizza and Brewing Company, the Victor Lundin Company, and Appert Insurance Services. Bicycle-friendly businesses support the health and well-being of people, communities, the environment, and the economy by offering people the resources and ability to travel by bike. Let's hear from some of the people at these bike-friendly businesses to get their perspective on why they want to be bicycle-friendly. Hi, I'm Ben Shire. I'm the mayor of Fergus Falls, Minnesota, and I am proud uh, that our community is a bike-friendly community. I'm proud that Union Pizza and Brewing Company right here is a bike-friendly business. It's important to our employees. It's important to our customers. I'm proud that City Hall is a bike-friendly business, and that, again, is important to the employees that work there at City Hall. It's important to the community. Uh, and for the community, it's the economic benefits uh, of business like this, bringing people in. It's the recreational and health benefits, obviously, that biking brings to the community. And it's just, it's just the feeling that getting out, being outside, exercising, and getting to know your neighbors. Uh, all around, being a bicycle-friendly community, being a bicycle-friendly business is, is good for our community. It's good for our business. And uh, that's why we support, proud to be in the top 10 bicycle-friendly business communities in the United States. My name is Tom Rufer. I'm a Fergus Falls City Councilman, and I'm also fortunate enough to work at Lake Region Healthcare, uh, which is our local hospital and clinic services here in Fergus Falls. We are a proud bicycle-friendly business, and it's important to us to be bicycle-friendly because we are encouraging a lifestyle of wellness. That's what we ask of our patients. And uh, if our employees can model that behavior, we see that as, uh, as a win for everyone. And we want our employees to be as active as possible. Uh, it's also important to the community that we are a bicycle-friendly business because it encourages our community to be more active and more of a lifestyle of wellness. And in addition, it's better for the environment. It uh, cuts down on uh, the use of fossil fuels. So we get people outside and walking and biking, and uh, it promotes community because people have more of a chance to interact with each other. So we're very grateful for the bicycle-friendly program and uh, happy to be a bicycle-friendly business. Yeah, I think it's important to be a bike-friendly business. Uh, just being downtown in the center of things, it's nice to be able to offer that uh, availability for our employees and customers to be able to park their bikes. And, um, you know, I know it's kind of a short season around here, but it's uh, beautiful day today and it just reminds us that uh, biking's right around the corner and whatever we can do to make everybody uh, accessible to all areas. Uh. Hi, Darren Appert with Appert Insurance Services here down in Lincoln and we're just going to talk a little bit about why I'm involved with uh, MN Bike and uh, Fergus Fall, Pedal Fergus Falls. Um, I kind of got started with it here a few years ago. Wayne Hurley here kind of got me introduced to it. I thought it'd be good for uh, something to get myself exposed a little bit the business here and, and donate a couple bikes to kids I, I guess I've been a bike rider all my life and I'd like to see that when kids are out and about on these nice days in the spring especially and and whenever they can ride uh, to jump on a bike and and see what they can what they can do and places they can go and we've got a lot of um, 
places around this area to ride bikes safely. So it's just good to, good to promote these bikes for, for having the kids get on them and, and start riding. Hey, Fergus Falls. See, I know a lot of things look different this year. There's a lot of community activities that we haven't able, been able to uh, take part in. A lot of those include the biking events that we've come to love, the Mayor's Bike Ride, the Lake Alice 100, and a lot of other uh, events that people have worked really hard to, to establish in this community. But I just want to encourage everyone to keep, keep up, get on your bikes, get out there and ride, and continue to make this community one that uh, supports bicycling and makes it a bicycle-friendly community. Thanks. Hi, my name is Lalita Serapanini. I'm an assistant professor in general internal medicine and a practicing physician here in the Twin Cities. I am also a member of Health Professionals for a Healthy Climate, which is an interprofessional climate and health action group. Um, I know I don't have to convince any of you here that climate change is already impacting the health of uh, Minnesotans. You know, we've burned enough fossil fuels in the past century and generated emissions um, that our planet is now one degree hotter than it was a century ago. And uh, the planet that's heating up is impacting our health. Summer and the health impacts that you're going to see are going to be, you know, extreme heat. And uh, so people suffering heat strokes. Um, you see that very hot weather also worsens air quality. So you have poor air quality and the health impacts coming from that like um, asthma and other heart and lung problems. Um, not only that, we also know that, you know, when we burn fossil fuels, for example, let's say in our cars uh, or uh, to run our buses, we have um, air pollution that impacts our health as well. There is, uh, you know, everyone, I think it's very intuitive to understand the impacts on your heart and lungs, but there is virtually no part in our body uh, that is uh, free from the impacts of air pollution. So people see strokes, um, the diesel emissions uh, put you at higher risk for lung cancer. Um, and, you know, these impacts, um, while they affect everyone, they're not equally distributed. Now, if you're hearing all of these impacts on air pollution and health, you might think that, you know, the best way that we can fix air quality, we can improve our health equity and address environmental justice is if we just move to cleaner cars, right? But we de redesign our transportation system with a focus of people instead of cars, uh, promoting biking and walking or what we call active transportation that will improve people's physical and mental health. Uh, if we're able to get people out of cars, we uh, reduce tailpipe air emissions, so we have cleaner air, and that's an immediate health benefit. Uh, and we reduce our carbon emissions, um, and you know we are going to uh, reduce the damage that we are doing to our climate. Um, and these benefits are going to be felt more in areas that all currently have poor air quality. So that is environmental environmental justice communities. While we all, all of us understand the benefits of biking and walking, I think we also understand that this is not the one solution. This is not a panacea. And I specifically want to uh, mention how, you know, people who are differently abled are not going to be able to participate in uh, walk and bike. Um, communities that are policed disproportionately uh, will not be able to make, uh, take an advantage of these uh, walk and bike infrastructure. So, um, Specifically, and in rural areas where you have to, you know, commute for a very long distance, you'll not be able to solely rely on bike and walk, and that's not what we are asking at all, right? Um, 
but there are opportunities where uh, walk and bike and active transportation can be a win-win strategy, both for our health and also for the health of our planet. Um, and especially if we want this to be an equitable solution, engaging with communities um, who can generate solutions um, that are that work for them. And these are community-based, community-led, and community-driven solutions uh, can be used to develop walk and bike infrastructure so that um, everyone has access to healthier modes of transportation. And I know from having lived in greater Minnesota for three years uh, that there were many places that I could walk to, um, but lack of you know um, safe sidewalks uh, or bike lanes would just made it feel unsafe to uh, let's say go to a grocery store even that was less than a mile away data shows that 35 percent of household trips uh, are less than two miles and so if we develop bike and walk infrastructure that can cater to those um, a smaller uh, trips that you make to the grocery store or to work, um, you know, that can result in a significant reduction in air pollution, carbon emissions, and also benefit our physical and mental health. Uh, you know, as a physician directly caring for patients and as a public health practitioner um, who thinks about the health impacts of climate change, um, I see that there are so many things, um, not just transportation, where, you know, uh, what's good for our health is also good for the health of our planet. And when it comes to transportation, biking and walking uh, can be a true win-win strategy. Thanks, Dorian, and hi, everyone. I'm joining you today from my home office in South Minneapolis, just a couple of blocks away from the Bicycle Alliance of Minnesota's main office. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Emily Smoke, and I work at the Minnesota Department of Health. Even in this virtual environment, it's so nice to be here with all of you today, working to help make Minnesota a better place for people to be physically active. At the health department, we know that transportation decisions play a critical role in influencing people's ability to live healthy lives. Walkable, bikeable communities are healthier communities, and increasing access to active transportation is one of the most equitable ways that we can increase physical activity opportunities for everyone. Through Minnesota's statewide health improvement partnership, also known as SHIP, we are able to support community-driven solutions and expand opportunities for active living in all 87 counties. Through SHIP, we take a policy systems and environmental change approach to help make it easier for people to be active in their communities where they live, work, and play. By working on primary prevention, we can keep people healthy by reducing chronic disease, including obesity, and lessen future healthcare costs. This work includes supporting efforts like active transportation policy and planning, safe routes to school, bicycle-friendly community, business and university programs, and generally increasing access to walking and biking opportunities statewide. If you don't already know your local SHIP coordinator, please let us know and we'll get you their contact information. These individuals are amazing resources for advancing walking and bicycling in your local communities, and there are many of them on here today with us representing all different parts of the state. For many of us, bicycling and walking have always been tools that we've relied on for health, transportation, and joy. But as I'm sure you've noticed over the last year, as you've answered questions about where to get an old bike tuned up, or pointed directions to a walking path, or maybe even when you were negotiating the last bike tube from your local bike shop, that there are many people in our communities and some who for the very first time are turning to walking and bicycling for those same reasons, health, transportation, and joy as a way to manage during this challenging time. 
I know for me personally, the health benefits of being able to safely walk and bicycle in my neighborhood have never been more apparent. Here in Minnesota, we are very lucky to have a statewide network of local ship coordinators and partners like the Bicycle Alliance of Minnesota to help increase access to safe walking and bicycling. Together, MDH, SHIP, and the Bicycle Alliance, along with other partners, such as the Minnesota Department of Transportation, we've been working to provide support and technical assistance to communities who are working on active transportation projects and planning, to host bikeable and walkable community workshops, and to work on state-level physical activity planning. You can also support building healthy communities through walking and bicycling. We encourage you to connect with your local ship coordinator and your local bikeman members to encourage local schools to implement safe routes to school programming, to encourage schools to offer the Walk Bike Fun pedestrian and bicycle safety curriculum, to help plan community bike rides and events like bike rodeos, to participate in bike to school day and walk to school day events in your neighborhoods, to get involved in community planning projects and ensure that walking and bicycling are prioritized, and of course, to tell your friends, family members, and local leaders about the health and equity benefits and impacts of investing in bicycling and walking. With your help, we can continue to make sure that everyone in Minnesota has the opportunity to safely walk and bicycle in their neighborhoods and communities. Thank you again for having me virtually with you here today, and thank you for making Minnesota the best place to walk and bike. Bye! Good evening, everyone. Thank you um, for taking time to be at the Minnesota Bike Summit. Uh, I was asked to share a little bit about Safe Routes to School in Minnesota. First of all, my name is Jill Chamberlain. I work at Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Minnesota in the Center for Prevention. And I have served as the organizer for the Minnesota Safe Routes to School Network for about the past 10 years. And I'm excited to share with you both some of the opportunities and some of the challenges that we've been facing. Not surprisingly, uh, COVID has had a tremendous impact on safe routes, but not just in its challenges, but there have been some opportunities that we've seen un unfold this past year. Uh, I think first, just for those that aren't familiar with safe routes to school, I just wanna give this reminder that the concept around safe routes to school is very much just this idea of where kids can and walk bike to school, we should be encouraging them to do so. And where they can't, we need to make sure that it's safe and feasible for them to do so. And so that might look like getting a sidewalk connected, improving a crossing at a certain intersection. Um, it can also look like making sure they have access to the education to, that they know how to ride a bike um, and have the confidence to ride a bike. So it's exactly what it sounds like. Um, the other thing I'll say about Safe Routes to School is while there is a very strong Safe Routes to School program here in Minnesota that primarily resides within the State Department of Transportation and involves funding and a couple different grant programs, um, Safe Routes is also something that's kind of this broader concept that is owned at all sorts of levels. It's about local initiatives that can literally sit with parents that are just trying to make it easier and better for their kids because that's something that they value. Um, it can sit within school leadership. It can sit within the city or county. Um, and, it, and so Safe Routes really can be a lot of different things. So I like to say that like it's both everywhere and also very specific into uh, your own work. So. With that, I want to pick some highlights for you. So first of all, the state Safe Routes to School program that's operated through the Minnesota Department of Transportation and relies on uh, consistent funding for the program that includes $500,000 that's uh, part of the general fund and something that often shows up in policy priorities to make sure that we are preserving that and sometimes increasing it. Um, that program is doing really well. Um, I think it's greatest challenge that it's had in this COVID time. Uh, the state Safe Routes to School coordinator, Dave Cowan, has been doing a great job. Um, the challenge he has had has been 
Uh, two of his colleagues uh, from the DOT have been reassigned over to MDH to assist with COVID response. You're gonna hear this recurring theme that because of all the attention and the impact that COVID has had, um, and also this intersection between health and transportation, several people from the transportation field have been reassigned. So with that change, it's really affected the capacity for the state program. But even with that strain on capacity, they have successfully awarded a variety of planning grants this past fall. And they also had a cycle of what are called the boost projects, which are small grants going directly possibly to schools or communities uh, to implement different ideas to help advance safe routes to school. Some of the projects supported in the boost uh, boost grants involved a lot of bike fleets, uh, increase of bike parking, and also some general education materials. So uh, the slides, there's the list of all the recipients of the boost grants. We are also really uh, pleased that there were the uh, diversity of geographies for the boost grants. And in the past, they've been a little bit more metro heavy. One asset for Safe Routes to School is it is very much a statewide initiative. This coming fall, there's gonna be additional Safe Routes to School funding. There will be um, both some infrastructure funding, planning, uh, and also another cycle for the boost grants and uh, possibly some bonding funding as well, pending um, some of this legislation. So a concern that's come up this last year, um, the distance learning, obviously kids were not going to school um, and we're doing learning from home. And then also um, what we found with, for uh, projects that we're working on planning grants with schools is that schools had no extra capacity. They didn't even have capacity. I mean, again, we've all been living this last year. They've been doing their best to just try to make sure students had access to technology and education content. And so really when we are trying to work with schools and talk about safe routes, it has been really challenging to have that be a top concern. Um, so one of the things that we've been doing with the Safe Routes program is adapting resources, specifically um, some work that Bike MN has led with the Walk Bike Fund curriculum, getting that to be um, an online tool, adapting it for distance learning uh, has been a huge, huge win and made the training more accessible. Additionally, instead of doing our traditional, you know, bike walk to school day events in the fall and in the spring, we adapted to bike walk to school or bike walk anywhere. And that that was fun because it was able to kind of highlight different possibilities within their own community. So that's something that I think has been an opportunity and a way for parents and student, well, kids to build their confidence in how they ride around communities and parents to feel more secure in letting their kids ride around or walk around their community. So that actually has been um, a strength. We've also seen um, updates of different resources, uh, especially around the policy guides for safe routes. So during this off, well, I'm gonna call an off season, uh, Dave and other folks working on safe routes, we've really worked at trying to kind of update things so that we were ready, especially as we start coming back to school. One of the biggest concerns as we return to in, in school learning and, uh, is actually, again, it's gonna come down to some parent attitudes. And um, one thing that's been uh, alarming for us is because of people's confidence around COVID and vaccinated, not vaccinated, and the, the issue of, you know, is it safe to put my kids on the bus? Is it safe to let them, you know, walk or bike? Um, that we're seeing a, a significant increase of parents saying that they are more likely to drive their kids to and from school. And so that has us uh, concerned at the idea of seeing a significant increase of personal family vehicles around arrival and dismissal at schools, that that causes, it increases risk of traffic incidents for the kids who are currently walking and biking. And so with some of the Safe Routes coordinators working at their respective schools, that's one thing they're trying to get ahead of to make sure that they're thinking about some of the other tools they could use. And that might include working on remote drop-off sites, increasing walking school bus usage, or trying to think of other ways to alleviate those concerns and also um, 
not have, again, that significant increase in the car traffic. So that's something that's on our mind and that we're a bit worried about. And then um, this coming year, as we kind of, I don't want to say go back to normal because I don't think that's what's going to happen, but start to kind of get into this place of rebuilding. Um, this last year, we completed the Safe Routes to School Strategic Plan, and there are three areas of growth that we will be uh, pursuing collectively. Um, one is our continued pursuit to address equity. And again, we've made significant strides in how funds are awarded to take into account uh, an equity score to make sure that we are addressing needs and making sure that folks are, the communities that have unique needs or different needs or greater needs, those are being addressed. Um, and so we will continue to work on how and focus equity in how we're implementing Safe Routes to School. And then the other two areas that I think are particularly exciting, uh, youth engagement. Uh, Safe Routes to School in Minnesota has done a really good job of working with elementary and middle school. Um, but what we haven't done as well is have build that skill and make sure that we are engaging with youth to identify and have them kind of leading some of this work. So the opportunity to uh, really kind of dig in, think about how it is we could better engage, especially at the high school level or how that may start at the middle school level and then foster up to the high school level is all very exciting. So that's something that uh, in the coming months we'll be uh, learning more, starting uh, listening to more youth to understand what might be the areas of interest for them. And then the last area of growth this year is around school siting. And again, this is one that what taking, it's a really dry subject. I, I'm not gonna lie. I will, but it's, it has everything to do with where we're placing our schools. And we see, especially across Minnesota, when neighborhood schools that maybe are older um, and don't have all the, the capacity that the community needs, when they decide to build a new school, it is often on the edge of town or out in a space where it's not around any neighborhoods. And then you create a whole other set of transportation issues. And so one of our, our hope is to better understand the issues and be able to work with communities to identify possible alternatives to relocating schools or how that, um, uh, other facilities or spaces could be used. So we're very much at the uh, early learning stage for that, but that's another area. And if you're interested in any of those, I would say you could reach out to myself or to Dave Cowan. Um, both of us will be working together on that. So um, broadly, safe routes can only be as effective as it is um, when it is resourced. And so the fact that we have a Safe Routes to School coordinator, and we have state funding, and then we also are able to access some different federal funds that makes a huge difference. So uh, I would just put the plug in and first acknowledge and appreciate all the work the Bike Alliance of Minnesota does in terms of advocating for Safe Routes to School funding. And then to also make sure that um, you just have a chance to, when you're speaking with your legislators, to share what, that, what you value and um, make sure that they know that. So. That is the Safe Route Summary. So thank you very much. I hope you have a great day on the Hill. Good evening. My name is Vic Boer, and I'm your contract lobbyist for the Bike Alliance. First of all, let me wish all of you a happy St. Patrick's Day. To those of you that are Irish, and to those of you who wish you were Irish, at least on this day. Uh, more than 160 years ago, Charles Dickens wrote his famous novel, A Tale of Two Cities. It was the best of times, and it was the worst of times. It was a season for light and a season for darkness. It was the spring of hope and the winter of despair. If Charles Dickens were alive today and living in Minnesota, he might well be thinking of a sequel, The Tale of Two Legislatures because that's what we have in Minnesota right now. We have one for the Senate and one for the House. We have one for the Democrats and one for the Republicans. And we now have one for the metro area and one for the rural area. After the tumultuous 2020 elections, when the Democrats took control of Senate, Minnesota became the only state in the entire country that had a divided legislature. Unfortunately, it's not just a political divide, it's now a geographical divide. 
after the election, Minnesota remained pretty much like it had the, the two years prior. The Republicans kept control of the state Senate and the Democrats kept control of the state house. Uh, albeit both of them lost a few members and the margins are much tighter now. Instead of 35 Republicans, there are 34. Instead of 75 Democrats, there are 70. Uh, the agenda for the Minnesota legislature is generally the same as it would be in many, many years. I've been around the Capitol for roughly 48 seasons. And every, every legislative session takes on a, a, a life of its own. But this year, it's gonna be particularly different. And there are three reasons why the agenda is gonna be different. One is the, the social justice public safety issue that was brought about because of the tragic death of uh, George Floyd. The second one is obvious. It's the COVID-19 pandemic. Not only has that changed the way we do business at the Capitol, with a lot of Zoom hearings and distance uh, voting uh, and day at the Capitol like we're doing here uh, virtually, but it's also changed the agenda. Uh, obviously, we deal with health related issues coming from COVID, but the slowdown of the economy, the closure of businesses, the furlough of jobs, distance learning and education are all things that we haven't had on the agenda in this kind of detail in the past. The third issue is redistricting. This every 10 years, the legislature redistricts, and that's gonna be on the mind of lawmakers as they proceed through this session. Um, let me give you a little sense of what that all means. Does that mean that the legislature will be able to pull together and work together to get things done, to share a common interest? Or does that mean that this is gonna divide us even further? The verdict is still out, but so far it's the latter. Let me give you some examples. Uh, session started on January 6th. Today is March 17th. We've already had 72 days of the legislative session. There were only 60 days remaining. So far, when I last checked, there have been more than 2000 bills that have been introduced. Guess how many have passed and been signed into law? Four. Four bills out of more than 2,000. So the legislature generally starts slow, but this is terribly slow. They're spending all of their time introducing bills, debating issues, and passing bills on the floor that don't have a chance to pass in the other body. So the one thing that they have to do it's their responsibility is that they have to have a balanced budget at the end of the year. And the end of the fiscal year is June 30th. If they don't produce and enact a balanced budget, the state will go into a shutdown and neither side wants that to happen. So the, the process of balancing a budget has actually already started. We had our last uh, revenue forecast on February 26th. That had some good news to it and hopefully will help the legislature move along. We now have a projected surplus of $1.6 billion instead of a projected deficit of 1.3 billion, which was the, for, the most previous forecast before then in December. Let me put this in some context for you because the the revenue forecast becomes the basis for doing the budget. The spending targets and the tax targets are all set based on what that forecast is. And the forecast has been moving around. Last year at this time, on March 17, 2020, we had a projected surplus of 1.3. Then just four months later, after the pandemic had set in and businesses were closing and, and furloughs were laying people off, it got projected to be a $4.7 billion deficit in just four months. The economy had slowed, the determination was made that revenues will be coming in uh, much slower than previously. Then it got upgraded again in December 
but we still had a $1.3 billion uh, deficit. Now, a year later, we're back to almost where we were on March 17th of 2020, $1.6 billion surplus. So, so what does that mean? That means that they're gonna have to move cautiously because that, that surplus was created not so much because of an improvement in the economy, and that's happening to some degree, it has improved because of the three COVID care bills that were passed at the federal level. Billions of dollars have come in from the federal government to states like Minnesota, and that's what's given us a budget surplus. So they're gonna to need to be cautious on how they spend that money. They're gonna also have to try to use that federal money to supplement their general fund budget. Things like COVID related activities, are eligible expenditures of that federal money. So again, they're gonna to have to be cautious and it probably means that, uh, that they won't have to raise taxes. The Republicans are saying that now and they're probably right. They won't have to raise taxes to balance the budget. But if you wanna continue investments in education and healthcare and transportation, particularly active transportation that we're interested in, then tax increases should be on the table. As we think about this legislative session, uh, keep in mind what, uh, what Dickens was saying in his tale of two cities. The good times and the bad times are getting better, not worse. The season for light and the season for darkness and the spring of hope and the despair of winter may well be metaphors for COVID and, and the, the legislative session. Hopefully, with the increases in COVID cases, the hospitalizations and the deaths that brought upon the despair of winter, hopefully we now are gonna see the, the hope of spring with the vaccines, and hopefully we will see light at the end of the tunnel for the legislature as they grapple with the rest of these issues, COVID included, and try to produce a balanced budget by the end of the year. All right, well, good morning, Senator Moore. Uh, my name is Julia Eagles. I am a constituent of yours. My partner and I moved to your district a few years ago and we live over on the Northwest side of town. Well, good morning. Uh, well, welcome. I don't know that we have met before, uh, First of all, happy St. Patrick's Day. I'm Irish, Moore's, Moore's Irish, so I hope you, you're enjoying the holiday like I am. Uh, so I I should have told my LA, I didn't realize you were in town. We could have met over at the dinner bell and had coffee for our, our meeting. Uh, I, I try to help out, you know, because of COVID, these businesses are really struggling. Uh, and then the governor shuts them down. So I, you know, it's terrible order, terrible order. It just, yeah, crazy. we've been really, I mean, yeah, we've been really trying to do our part too, you know, getting takeout when we can. And yeah, now that, now that things are looking good, any opportunity to kind of meet in person with folks safely, it's, it's nice to do that, get a little break from all well, the video mm -hmm. conference calls, but I'm good sure for you're you. uh, sick of them. So what, what can I help you with? Sure. Well, yeah, thanks for making the time today. Um, I'm a member of the Bicycle Alliance of Minnesota, which you may have heard of. Uh, and we have, you know, a few different things, a few different bills we're hoping the legislature will consider this session that generally will update some of the riding rules to make it safer for bicyclists. Uh, there's another that would update the e-bike rules and regulations to be consistent with what some other states and countries are doing and current industry standards. You know, that's kind of a change in the biking world to have electric bikes. So just make some updates there. And then uh, in the omnibus bill, in addition to the policy changes around riding and e-bike rules, uh, we're hoping that we can provide some funding from various sources, including a metro area sales tax for transit biking and walking uh, and some funding in the bonding bill for safe routes to schools. Oh, good. Uh, first of all, I wanna let you know that I'm a strong supporter of bikes. Uh, I think it's a great recreation and it's good for you, healthy. Uh, there, we have a lot of bicyclist in town here and uh, I strongly support that. Uh, sometimes my good friends across the aisle don't don't know that and don't think that because I I, I, I uh, 
agree to disagree with them on some certain issues, but basically I, I support bikes. Uh, I love them. Um, the electric bike bill, we heard that in committee and I think that was, uh, it was, it passed. I voted for it. Great. I think, uh, I think that bill's a good bill and has a good chance of, of passing this session. Uh, what, what were the other ones? Sure. So, uh, one of them is just another, uh, a change to some of the rules, the riding rules to make it safer for bicyclists. And then in the omnibus bill, uh, a couple funding pieces, one, uh, in the form of a metro area sales tax to support transit biking and walking and then okay. funding in the bonding bill for safe routes. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 I, I know that one. Uh, I, the bike rules doesn't ring a bell with me, but, uh, the, the funding bill, the, um, uh, yeah, the Dems are, have been pushing, uh, for an increase in the sales tax and the gas tax and all of this, and that that's just not going to happen. And I'll, I'll explain why, uh, we now have a $1.6 billion surplus. Uh, the budget has fluctuated. The forecast has fluctuated, but we have a surplus now of 1.6 billion. We were just notified uh, two days ago that the federal government is going to be sending us $2.6 billion from their recent COVID uh, recovery bill. And local governments in Minnesota are going to get $2.1 billion. That's $6 billion, a $6 billion surplus. My, my constituents would lynch me if I supported a tax increase with that much money on hand. So you, you need to start thinking about another way to to get money for the bikes. Sure. Well, I mean, I, like you said, I'm really glad. I think this, this can be a bipartisan issue that, that folks can support. Um, and I'm glad to hear your support above. I mean, we're really just simply saying if the legislature approves a Metro sales tax for transit biking and walking, that there should be a, a percentage for biking and walking dedicated right. within that. Right. Um, and we also have a proposal to um, have an option of taxing ourselves with a specialty license plate um, and doing something that others are proposing for automobiles by dedicating the sales tax paid on bicycles to active transportation. So again, think about some creative ways well, to direct that funding. Well, I, I, I like that idea. Um, you know, we're starting to get a few, uh, a few license plates bills in committee now for a while we weren't doing that, but I like the idea of a user fee where somebody is actually paying for uh, the, what they want. So if you're generating revenue that could help pay for uh bike uh, lanes and things like that uh, yeah let, let me let me ask you uh well n now that you brought it up would you support you know a license on bikes as a way of raising money to help fund bikes i mean i think one of the things we like to correct with folks is that you know bicyclists are already contributing to road improvements you know most of that funding for roads especially the ones that have a lot of cyclists on them, it comes from property taxes. So, you know, the cost for bike infrastructure is, is so minimal compared to what we're paying for motorized transportation. Um, there's the ways that, you know, the people who are using bikes on our roads actually already pay a higher share of their cost than people who drive cars. Right. That's my, that's my position on that. Uh, see, I'm running late. I, I'm so sorry. Julia, it was so nice to meet you. Yeah, and I really will hope you, I hope you'll consider um, supporting our policy proposals. I'll, I'll send along a copy of the rules and regulations changes um, that are in law in many other states that we're proposing and also those e-bike updates just that it sounds like yeah, you're already and, supporting, and, which we appreciate. And send me something on those bike rules. I'm sorry, that just doesn't ring a bell right now. Sure. Yep. Yeah, I'm happy to share that. And yeah, thanks so much for your time. Um, right. I really hope we'll continue to get to work together and um, you can support some of our efforts. Okay. Well, thank you. Nice meeting you too. Yeah, thanks. Well, let's have a let's have a quick conversation about what went well uh, with Julia and Vic. And, you know, one of the first things I saw was, and I think it's something that everybody needs to prepare for, is that uh, legislators don't always know what you're talking about, and they will try and talk about what they want to talk about. Um, and you have to be careful to steer the conversation back to what Julia. Uh, or what 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 you're interested in talking with them about, um, and I thought Julia did a fabulous job of doing that. Wanted to talk about the governor and the and the executive order. That's why I I threw that sidebar out there right away that we should have been meeting in person and coffee. 
Uh, she handled that very well. The last thing you want to do is start your meeting by picking a fight. I knew she was going to talk about bikes. So I wanted to establish right away that I'm a big supporter of bikes, even though I'm not. Good morning, Representative Eagles. Um, I'm CJ Linder. I live in town. I, I voted for you. I ride everywhere. My partner and I are car free, and I think that it should be safe for us to get everywhere we want to go by bicycle. All right. Well, nice to meet you, CJ. Thanks for um, setting this up. Always good to talk to a constituent. Um, and yeah, I mean, I'm a supporter of active transportation, so interested in hearing your thoughts on this and what can I do for you today? Great. Uh, I'm a, a member of the Bicycle Alliance of Minnesota. I, I believe you've heard of us. Mm -hmm. um, and they are supporting a couple bills this year that I favor, and I'd like to ask you to support them too. There's a bill that would update some of the riding rules to make it safer for bicyclists. Um, another that would adopt a national standard for regulating e-bikes. And another that would provide some funding. Oh, and I think there should be more funding in the bonding bill for safe routes to school. Great. I mean, those are all things I support. Um, I also see that Representative Bernardi has introduced an omnibus bill. Yeah, that's great. And I forgot, I would. I also would like you to support the Idaho stop rules. I think that if cyclists shouldn't have to stop at stop signs, that's ridiculous. Um, we, we don't go very fast and we can stop easily and it takes all of our energy. Uh, I, we, we also need photo enforcement because there's so many crazy drivers out there that are speeding and running red lights and they're really dangerous. Um, and, and we should have a subsidy for e-bikes to, to encourage people to, to get out of their motor vehicles and, uh, use alternative transportation. Those are all interesting ideas. I, I mean, I know we've got a, a bill before us here that we're dealing with. So that's kind of, you know, in this session, um, with the legislature now at large, you know, we're, we're kind of trying to get done what we can. So, um, yeah, interested to hear your thoughts on, on those particular those particular policy and funding pieces that we're considering this session. Yeah, well, I mean, this is really, really important because, you know, riding bikes is is more dangerous than riding in cars. And we just, we aren't doing enough for this. We could we could have a statewide 20 mile an hour speed limit. There's there's just so many more things that we can do. And I I, I think you should uh, write, write some of these bills to make sure that we we protect people who are choosing to, to ride instead of driving cars. I mean, like I said, yeah, I, I'm definitely supportive of active transportation and, and various ways to support that. And it's it's just a matter of kind of what's realistic um, for us to do this session and, and what we've got already kind of on the agenda on the docket here for what we'll be hearing. Okay, well, how about if I just leave these bill numbers for you and watch the website to make sure that you've signed on as a co-author? Okay, yeah, great. I'm, I'm happy to see that information and, and always want to be accountable to my constituents. So I appreciate that. Great. Well, let's talk about uh, uh, advocate CJ Lindor's meeting with uh, state representative uh, Julia Eagles. I think Julia could run for office in Minneapolis right now. She fits it very well. <laughs> As you might guess, CJ was uh, uh, a little bit the overzealous advocate. Um, and uh, uh, I thought he did a nice job of playing that role and providing the example that, you know, he didn't really stay on message this year um, and perhaps didn't really understand that getting these bills passed through both bodies of the legislature is a huge challenge. And that Thanks again for being part of the Minnesota Bike Walk Summit. Your task, should you choose to accept it, is to make Minnesota a better place to bike and walk. That can include working with your city, county, and school district staff and elected leaders. And we hope you'll take the time to share your priorities and bike men's priorities with your legislators in the next couple of weeks. And let us know how it goes. We'll send you a follow-up email that includes a link to a reporting form. We sent you a link to the full legislative agenda in the email you got yesterday. 
but it's too long to go over here and Vic, Julia and CJ covered much of it at a high level. But let me quickly share a little bit about our legislative strategy. The 13 page active transportation omnibus bill, House file 1566 has all of the policy and most of the funding ideas we've tried to pass, but did not pass in the past few years. That includes updating the statutes to reflect the three classes of e-bikes and the policy bill that among other things replaces that you must ride as far to the right as practicable with as far to the right as is safe as determined by you. And it makes it legal to ride through a right turn lane without turning. There are also policy provisions in the omnibus bill that include requiring schools to teach active transportation in addition to bus safety, more local authority for school speed zones and setting speed limits, requiring MnDOT to assist local governments with active transportation funding and planning. It reinstates the MnDOT Non-Motorized Transportation Advisory Committee and designates the Mississippi River Trail and the North Star Bicycle Route as state bicycle routes and names the North Star route after former Congressman Jim Overstar. The omnibus bill also has several funding provisions. As Senator Moore and Julia discussed, it creates a Pedal Minnesota license plate and dedicates the funds to the active transportation program account. MnDOT, bless their heart, has been spending more of their federally authorized trans amount of, on transportation alternatives. This requires them to just keep doing that. It has a safe routes to school bonding appropriation and should a Metro sales tax for transit, biking and walking pass, it would require 10% of it to be spent on active transportation. You also heard Senator Moore say that more taxes are simply not going to happen because there's a surplus and a ton of federal money headed our way. So our recommendation is that you simply tell your state and local leaders that you hope some of that one time money from the federal government gets spent on safe routes for everybody. Why not spend it on better crosswalks on Main Street, a lighted crosswalk at a school, bike lanes or bike boulevards, or simply put some in the MnDOT active transportation and safe routes to school grant program accounts. And make sure you tell them that you know that small infrastructure projects employ more people per dollar than big ones do. I put a little bit more detail on this in the scheduling and meeting with legislators fact sheet. We know we can count on you to do this. It's easy. All you have to do is go to the legislative homepage, click on and click on and find your member. Check their committee assignments and, and see what time they have committee meetings. And then go to go to Zoom. And if you don't already have an account, sign up for a free account and send them a meeting notice and, an, and a note that says, if this time and date does not work for you, please let me know a time and date that does. Now I think we have a few more minutes for questions before our legislative champions join us. Our, our legislative champions are all super, super busy, especially uh, uh, are members of the House. Um, so, uh, you know, as Senator Dibble, if you don't mind, um, Representative or Chair Lilly has a meet a, a hearing right now. Um, so if we could have him speak for a few minutes uh, and then we'll go to Senator Dibble. Representative Lilly, you wanna unmute yourself and pop up on the screen? Hi, Dorian and uh... Everybody, thank you for the invite. Uh, um, there's a, a bunch of friends in the Minnesota House of, uh, of bikers and uh, they are across party lines. Um, Rep Representative Doubt was telling me about his new e-bike. He's got one of those uh, 
$6,000 trucks or more. He actually bought one for his nephew. I don't know where he gets 12 grand, but there must be a little extra money as being a minority leader. But uh, I drive uh, a lot of old stuff myself. But uh, no, thank you for having us. Uh, um, I don't know what you want out of us, but uh, um, you just want a brief kind of what we're working on? Sure, that would be great. And uh, I, I just wanted to share with everybody that Representative Lilly is working on our policy bill. Um, it's, it's a standalone bill um, that's also included in the omnibus bill, which we can talk about in a little bit. But uh, yeah, go ahead and share what's- Yeah, uh, yeah just part. real quickly, uh, again, you know, thank you. Uh, uh, we are, I am, uh, we had a good hearing on the policy bill the other day and, uh, you know, uh, we, we're not sure what's going on in the Senate, but that's, you know, whatever, we'll try to uh, sneak it in. And uh, it, it was good, uh, good response to the bill and a unanimous vote. And uh, I thought that was good. It was just kind of cleaning up uh, um, some stuff. And Dorian, you did a great job of speaking for, for all of us. Um, you know, I'm lucky enough to be chair of uh, Legacy and we're, we're investing, uh, you know, our state in uh, uh, parks and trails, uh, Almost a hundred, you know, a hundred over a hundred. Sorry, over a hundred million dollars in uh, in the three tiers: uh, Greater Minnesota, uh, um, and then the DNR Parks and Trails, and then uh, obviously also in the Metro. And uh, just some great work. There's uh, we've seen it with COVID that uh, you know people are getting outside, super excited, and uh, and we got to do uh, what we can to reinvest and to keep that and drawing connections from you know different things and. So there's good news. I have a kind of a neat bill and bonding that I just want to mention real quick and then I'll be done. Uh, um, we've, um, we've heard from the parks and trails uh, folks that uh, we, you know, we're in a bit of a trouble down the road with our uh, trail maintenance. So there's a bill that we're going to try to push through bonding and it's, uh, um, we're, we're about 70, 80% of good trails, but if over a short period of time, if we don't invest more money, the DNR can only do about 14 miles a year of our trails. And so we need to do this bill to kind of push it to, to invest, to make sure we protect. Because, you know, when you're riding on a bike or, uh, you know, you see kids or families, you know, you don't want them to trip and fall and, you know, not want to come back. So you want it safe. And uh, so anyways, we're, we're doing a lot of great investments. And uh, again, thank you for leading on these issues, uh, uh, Dorian and the group. Um, and, you know, safety is just continues to be a primary thing for me. I just... Uh, we keep hearing about all these people that are injured, whether walking or biking, and it just is scary out there. So um, be, be safe and we'll keep working what we can as policymakers. But thank you, sorry I talked so long. I hope that was- Oh, that's, no, that's great. We'll let you get back to your hearing. And yep. thanks so much for joining us. And for those of you who don't know, uh, Representative Lilly actually rode his bicycle all the way across the country by himself. So. This yep. is not, uh, uh, he's definitely considered a legislative champion. So okay. thanks again. I and move slow now, I'm a fat tire bike rider and just, I love it. Uh, you know, I've got the tri bikes, but they just hang on the ceiling. Uh, I've got an old Surly Pugsley that's uh, my go-to. Anyways, thank you. All right, thanks so much. And, nice and, 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 and another one of our great legislative champions is Senator Scott Dibble from uh, Minneapolis. Uh, so welcome, Senator Dibble. Well, thank you, uh, Dorian and Vic, and uh, I see you have uh, 127 people on the call. So that's really amazing. That's fantastic. So I'm, I'm really happy to be here, and I'm glad to see such a, a big turnout. And um, as I say every year when I run over to the church across the street when you're there, um, uh, nothing is more important than when constituents engage with their elected representatives and, and uh, you know, bring their stories and their ideas and their values and their, and their um, you know, their, their, their policy priorities, et cetera, and engage in that relationship building and that conversation and, you know, pressure, you know, pressuring us to, to pay attention to the things you care about. Um, that's how the system is designed to work. And when that doesn't happen, it's not functioning most effectively. So, so thank you for your, you know, gathering your steam and your, your rally and, and uh, you know, go forth and, and do your citizen lobbying thing in the coming days. Um, 
I was glad to hear uh, Representative Lilly's report because um, I'm always happy to hear about um, momentum and progress. Um, and of course, there's more of it to talk about and point to in the House than there is in the Senate. Although um, uh, I am fortunate to be carrying the e-bikes bill, um, which seems to be the feel good bill of the year. <laughs> so that's making good progress. We've had three hearings now and had the final one today. And now we're back to the Committee of Origin where it looks like it's gonna be taken into uh, the transportation bill. Unfortunately, in the Senate transportation bill will be a number of provisions that are harmful to uh, planning and paying for uh, bicycle facilities um, on our roadway infrastructure and the like. But, um, you know, everything is a, a function of uh, negotiation and give and take. And that won't be the final word um, because we will go from the transportation omnibus bill to a conference committee where we will reconcile all, all of the differences with the house approach on all these matters. And I'm, I know that the house will come in with a strong active transportation program. Um, you know, safe routes to school is more of a bonding bill kind of a thing, but um, who knows, maybe we'll have a general fund appropriation in the, in the house bill. Um, the, uh, the policy bill um, that uh, Representative Lilly is carrying is carried by, um, I believe, Representative Howe, who's on the committee in the, in the Senate, but he hasn't gotten a hearing. I don't know if he's going to be getting a hearing on that, if he's pushing one for one or not, but we haven't seen that yet uh, show up in the Senate. Um, but, um, you know, a, a lot of what I'm talking about is really, um, mostly about the chair and his feelings about bicycling. Um, there, there has been a lot of success and that's attributable to bike men and all of you in really engaging in uh, a lot of forward movement and progress and education and, and a willingness on the part of even my counterparts on the other side of the aisle to think favorably on biking and what it means for our quality of life for our communities, for transportation, for fitness, et cetera. And so, you know, it is changing and, and we're making progress and, and, I, and I take encouragement from that. So um, I will continue to uh, push and persist. I think it's also really, really important. Um, you know, unfortunately the, the transportation proposals that we've seen coming both from the executive branch as well as the, you know, the majority party in the Senate, um, haven't been very robust for roads, bridges, transit, bike or walk, in terms of putting new resources on the table. I'm pretty sure that Chair Hornstein um, will be offering a bill that uh, you know, does try to put new resources on. But we absolutely have to keep talking about funding active transportation, bicycling facilities, um, livable communities, safe routes to school, and, and always make that a part of the conversation um, whenever we're talking about transit and roads and bridges, whether those are state roads or local roads or greater Minnesota transit or metro transit, the next words out of, out of our mouths have to be bike uh, and bike walk. Um, and so um, I've introduced a bill that, that, that does try to um, pay attention in the metro area to active transportation, putting those resources on the table and then planning for those and, and how, we, how we allocate those funds among communities in the metro area. I will continue to pursue that idea until I'm in a position to get it passed. So I think that's really, really important. Um, so with that, Dorian, um, that's, that's what I have to say in my report. I'm available to sign off and let you guys continue with your meeting or respond to questions, whatever you need. Could you hang on just for a couple seconds because yeah. Representative Elkins has joined us and he's the, he's the house author of the electric bike bill. Uh, update. And then I do have some questions that I'd love to ask you. So if you could hang on for five more minutes, that would be great. Um, so, uh, and, and Representative Elkins, sorry, I didn't get you the link to the meeting until just a few minutes ago, but uh, welcome. Uh, uh, Representative Elkins represents uh, Southwest Bloomington uh, and Quality Bicycle Products is in his district. He rides frequently and uh, uh, we're happy to have him as the chief author of the e-bike bill update. 
Yeah, and uh, the bill was also heard, uh, of course, this week uh, in the House uh, Environment Committee and is being laid over for inclusion there as, as well. And uh, to thank uh, um, Senator Dibble for uh, reaching out to contact his close personal friend, Rick H Hansen, the chair of that committee, to get us the hearing because it wasn't, wasn't certain. So, Scott, you, you submitted it for us. And uh, so we're, uh, I think we're in good shape on that. It's uh, in the proper hands uh, in, in the House now as well. Great. Well, thank you very much for both being here. Um, and, and if anybody has any questions uh, about these bills or other bills, uh, please put them in the chat box. But one of the things that I wanted to ask you both is there's $2.6 billion of federal money coming to the state of Minnesota and 2.1 going to local units of government. Um, I don't and, and, and I'm sure you don't know all the rules about that, but uh, uh, my question is, will the, the state and even local units of government be able to use some of that money for active transportation? Because small infrastructure projects uh, are gonna put people to work. And then the smaller the project, the more people they employ per dollar spent. So. Your thoughts on that would be great. And I'll see if we have any other questions while you're answering that. Um, Steve, I don't know if you know the answer. I don't know the answer literally. I have, I have absolutely um, no idea what the answer is at this point. I will say that um, just one quick, I don't know if Vic, um, Vic was talking a little bit about the surplus, um, you know, a, a, a big part of the, you know, our ability to pivot from deficit to surplus is attributable to these federal dollars that are, that have come in and are coming in. Um, and uh, and it, that's good news to be sure, you know, we go from a fairly significant deficit position, both in this biennium as well as, you know, the, the next biennium. Um, but it's important to know that, that most of that surplus um, occurs on a one-time basis. Uh, the, 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 and, and it occurs for several reasons. One is, of course, um, these federal dollars. Another is because we've had decreased spending, you know, paradoxically attributable to the pandemic in a lot of, of, of categories. And so our, our outflow is a little bit less in some, in some instances. Um, and then, of course, you know, some improvement in tax receipts because of the, you know, the improvement in the economy. Um, but the vast majority, all but 200 and some million of dollars of that is only, only going to occur on a one time. So we can't really spend that money on anything that obligates us to ongoing uh, budgetary responsibilities and obligations, um, because that would be irresponsible. Um, unless we raise the ongoing sustained form of revenues that you know pay for things that would occur um, in subsequent years. Um, but I will say that the deficit um, or the surplus does take pressure off of, you know, so even if there's not money that's directly attributable to infrastructure and infrastructure specifically for, for bike and bike ped types of initiatives or projects, you know, it could conceivably free up some dollars that might, you know, in other parts of the budget that could, could allow us to do that. But if I were to guess, Dorian, I would say probably the dollars that are coming in, a lot of them are, you know, are categorized and specific to COVID response around education, around delivering um, the vaccine, you know, public health initiatives, um, backfilling um, uh, some public budgets that have suffered pretty serious consequences of transit um, uh, as a result of the downturn uh, and the like. Um, my, my guess would be probably not, but you know, maybe it gives us a little latitude to look at, at some other resources that already exist. Uh, Dorian, this is Vic, can you hear me? Uh, sure. Uh, I would just throw out to Senator Dibble and Representative Elkins the, the potential here. Uh, obviously, I think there's an expectation that the federal dollars would have to be COVID related. I think you can connect the dots and make a case that uh, getting outdoors, practicing social distance, whether it's on your bike or hiking, can and is COVID related. And I, I have a suspicion that legislators are gonna be tripping all over themselves trying to figure out how to use that money up because if you don't use it, you're gonna to have to give it back. 
Uh, and I think the same case could be made with local governments. Now, I, this is this is recent news. You just found out about this money a week or so ago. Uh, so I don't think any quick decisions are being made on that. But you might want to keep this in the back of your minds that there might be potential here, even though it's one time money. You know, if you pave a trail or paint a bike lane, you don't have to do it again. It's done. So one time money actually fits in some of these projects. So that's my two cents worth. Thank you, Vic. Um, there's a couple questions in the chat box and, and one I can answer myself is, yes, the e-bike update does include uh, uh, the provision for a throttle uh, bike, throttle assisted bikes. So uh, that the class one and class three are pedal assist only, but class two is a throttle assist. And I don't imagine DNR and other trail authorities would have any concern about providing an exemption for people who use adaptive bikes. Um, there was also a question, uh, Representative Elkins, about um, uh, your bill addressing fare evasion and establishing a transit ambassador program. Uh, and will, will, help, will that help people choose to walk and bike more? Yeah, I think, uh, and Senator Dibble is the Senate author for that bill as well, and uh, that one has uh, progressed to the uh, 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 to the floor. I think is it in? Um, are you? Is it still in committee in the Senate? I think we've we've moved it to the General Register in the House. I think we're I think we're waiting on the Senate right now. Uh, but I I think you know to the extent that it um, um, you know adds more uh, eyes onto the trains, makes that that things uh, you know safer for everyone, including cyclists who are using the trains. I have myself taken uh, use the train to uh, get my bicycle to the. Uh, Diabetes Society's annual uh, Ride for the Cure event in May uh, from, from Bloomington. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm a cyclist who has put my bike on, on the train. And uh, I, I, I think to the extent that we're able to improve uh, uh, safety on the trains and, and buses, uh, it, it makes those you know, more useful, more safe uh, amenities for, for cyclists as well. Great. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't completely understand the question um, if, if it's going to cause transit to be less attractive because it's, there's going to be administrative citation, if, if that's the gist of the question. I'd say the answer to that question is no. But, um, but I, um, uh, I'm very encouraged that we're making progress on this subject because the idea is the, the general gist of the whole bill is to remove from criminal sanction fair evasion because it's kind of a punishment that doesn't fit the crime um and frankly it it uh not being enforced yeah it's not enforced because you know prosecutors and and the judiciary recognize it's a little bit uh a little bit of an extraordinary sanction for the level of transgression um and so then you know kind of everyone loses out but then paired with the transit ambassador program um which we have a Kind of a variation on that in the senate that's it's a long much longer story um yeah, we're, just, we're not calling not them ambassadors out. anymore <laughs> um, but the idea there of course is that we really address the needs that are presenting among people on the on transit um that might cause them to engage in antisocial behaviors like fair evasion and other kinds of antisocial behaviors um that make riding transit extremely uncomfortable for a lot of other people. Um, and, um, and, you know, it's just a much more holistic and humane response um, that creates all kinds of positive outcomes for everyone involved. Thank you. Um, and I just wanted to, you know, we've had a very full program and I didn't really have a, a, a chance to explain that in addition to the policy bill and the e-bike bill, uh, we have an omnibus bill um, and an omnibus bill is basically a, a catch everything bill. Um, it has been introduced in the House by Representative Bernardi. Um, and many of the provisions in that bill deal with funding. As we talked about earlier in the program, uh, it includes a Pedal Minnesota license plate. It includes the dedication of the sales tax paid on bicycles and bicycle parts. Um, ideas that we've talked about uh, uh, for a long, long time, 
Uh, and also it includes a provision that simply if the legislature author authorizes the Metro Council to uh, raise the sales tax in support of transportation, specifically transit, biking, and walking, that 10% of that would be dedicated to active transportation. And those provisions, as Senator Dibble uh, mentioned earlier, are, are really non-starters with the chair of the Senate Transportation Committee. Um, but we hope that they'll be on the table and negotiable uh, uh, as part of the conference committee uh, at the, at the when, when they get to, when the House and Senate get together to pass that bill. So Senator Dibble, if you have anything more you wanted to elaborate on, on funding, um, please share that with the gang. Well, um, so, uh, you know, the governor is not bringing any, any resources to the table, um, nor, is the, nor is the Senate. I think the House is going to try. Um, I believe um, that, um, you know, the needs are, are urgent. Um, you know, we know, we know we're falling behind on our, on our roadway infrastructure maintenance. You know, we have a system that's 50 years old and we're, we're, we're falling behind by literally hundreds of millions of dollars a year. And these are problems that, that don't go away. They only become more expensive, um, both attributable to inflationary growth, but the, the conditions just get worse and worse. Um, we know that um, those who rely on transit in a metropolitan area only have access to 10% or less uh, within a convenient, affordable uh, commute um, to 10% you know, or less of the jobs and other opportunities that are available to everyone else who have access to, to cars, of course. Um, and um, we've, been, we've been passing deficit budgets for Metro Transit for many years in a row now. So we happen to be able to paper over some of the uh, you know, more pressing shortfalls because of the one-time COVID dollars that have, have really kept Metro Transit whole with the downturn and the drop-off in ridership. But once things bounce back, the next thing we're looking at is dismantling the bus system. And that's, I'm not being hyperbolic here, that's the truth. Um, unless we increase revenue for transit. And with that, I believe should come um, a, a dedicated portion of those dollars for biking um, and for, for uh, pedestrian improvements. Um, and um, we should think about infrastructure, transportation, investments as a part of the economic recovery package. Um, you know, that's been shown time and again to be a way that you bounce back from economic distress. You make those public side investments in major infrastructure. Not only does it connect people to jobs and, and other opportunities that they need connection to, that they need access to, um, but, you know, it, it really puts a shot in the arm in terms of all of that construction activity and it's not just construction activity, there's a, there's a multiplier effect um, to that kind of, of economic effort, public infrastructure, construction. Um, but, you know, it has, there's a whole array of professions that, that are engaged and energized when you start um, planning for and building transit ways, bike ways, roads, bridges, et cetera. And um, we know that you know, what we put into transportation as a portion of our incomes is a tiny fraction of, of what we used to pay even 10, 15, 20, certainly 30 and 40 years ago. So um, the return is many times over what we put in. So I would say just keep advocating, you know, even in these times of economic difficulty, this is money well spent, um, you know, by the public. It, it really, when you aggregate it down to the per individual per household basis, it's a, it's a pretty small amount that we're talking about, whether it's an increase in sales tax in the Metro or gas tax or whatever, um, in terms of the benefit, even to the individual um, is many times more. Great, well, thank you too, very, very, very much. Um, I really appreciate you, you joining us and being our legislative champions. Um, and, uh, uh, Representative Bernardi is going to join us 
Um, so those of you who want to stay for grab yourself a beer and stay for trivia, um, we can uh, uh, we'll just break into our trivia session when Representative Bernardi is able to join us. So thanks so much, Senator Dibble and Representative Elkins. We really, really appreciate you being there and being our champions. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Great to see you all. So Ted, do you want to uh, uh, take over here? You're, uh, uh, you're our trivia lead. Oh, sure, certainly. Uh, and, and the rest of you, you know, please hang on if you can, because uh, Representative Bernardi is going to introduce or has introduced um, the omnibus bill uh, that includes the huge list of things that, you know, if you look at the bike minute legislative agenda uh, that was emailed out to you. Um, and uh, uh, she just texted me. So uh, perhaps she'll be on soon. So Oh, it's running longer than I thought. So, uh, so go ahead, Ted, and I'll give you a, a two minute warning uh, when she's going to jump on the call. Sure. Well, 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 let's give everybody, you know, if you want to take 60 seconds, if you do want to go grab yourself a beverage or something, uh, you know, feel free to do that. And, and all these, um, you know, the documents we're referencing, we're going to send those to you again. So don't feel like you have to copy down um, all these links and stuff right now. Um, and we're gonna we're gonna help if if, um, if you do uh, want to set up a meeting um, with your legislators uh, to kind of you know chat with them about these like really important issues that, that we've already been discussing. So um, yeah, but uh, this is kind of the uh, you know your 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 turn to kind of engage with uh, uh, with our with our Zoom features here. So I just created a number of polls um, kind of based on some of our summit. Um, uh, you know, some of these things and some of you've probably already seen. So hopefully on your screen, you see our first question. Keep score for yourself at home. Um, honor system, of course, and I'll give you about uh, 30 seconds here. So the question is, um, and, you know, if, if you're on your phone, you might not be able to see this. And it looks like Representative Bernardi's already here. So we'll just answer this question. Just answer uh, one question and, and we'll go to her. Yeah. So um, again, the question is, what Minnesota city has the highest number of bicycle friendly businesses per capita? And um, it looks like we got most of our answers are coming in here. Um, we'll give it another 10 seconds. So hopefully that doesn't give you enough time to look it up. So let's use your brain, not your Google. Um, so I will reveal and I think a lot of you are going to be very disappointed in your answer. Um, so um, a vast majority of you chose Fergus Falls, which was a very, very good guess. However, Grand Marais has more per capita, um, at least from the stats that I saw right now. Um, they've got two, and they have a population of 1,351. So they narrowly um, eke out um, Fergus Falls. Um, so um, anyway, uh, we'll get to some of these other ones here in just a minute. All right. Uh, Representative or Chair Bernardi. Thank you so much for joining us this evening and stepping away from your hearing. Uh, without further ado, if you're there, uh, please jump on because I know you're in a hurry. I can't hear. <laughs> Are you on mute? Oh, no. I'm here. I'm here. Oh, there I'm you here. are. Thank you. Thank you. I'm on my computer for a committee right now in Ways and Means. So thank you everyone for um, being here tonight. And it's an honor to uh, speak before you. I um, just wanna tell you how important you are as um, being advocates for people to be able to move about safely no matter what mode they, cho they choose, especially for um, biking and walking. And I just wanna let you know that you need to keep your voices up. We need not only on the bike bill, House File 1566, like uh, Gloria often calls it the active transportation omnibus bill. And I'm proud to be an author of that. And um, we, need, we need your support for that. There are so many different facets of that. I'm not sure if Dorian shared those with you yet, but I, I won't go into them, but 
they um, are really, really important. And I appreciate bike men for being leaders in the state and helping to make these things happen. And when I say bike men, that means all of you because you are strong together and it's it greatly appreciated. And I just wanna say that, I don't know if you all know this and oh, I just got off of my, um, my computer with the notes on it, but this Minnesota transportation goals in law, there's like 16 of them and about seven of them relate to biking and, walk, uh, biking and walking and uh, the environment. And, we, um, we need to really help encourage all those different goals to be worked on and to be met. So you, um, what you do is super important, not only for our environment, for the sustainability of our transportation system, the reliability of it, the resiliency, not only resiliency of our environment, but also resiliency in what we learned in this pandemic, being able to have transportation in uh, different ways is super, super, super important. And I um, also just want to mention the, the equity issue and making sure that everybody's voice is heard and that we make sure that everybody around the state has the opportunity to be able to bike and walk safely. And, and I um, just want to thank again, Dorian, his staff, and all the people who are part of Bike Men for their actual, their leadership in helping our state to be a great state and just keep it moving. We're, we're not even close to yet to where we need to be. And together we can create the kind of state in which we can enjoy, be healthy and to move about safely. So thank you for having me here tonight. All right, thank you so much. Um, Tell you what, I will have people just share questions with me if they have questions about the omnibus bill and your work, and uh, we'll let you get back to your your other hearing and your vote. Um, well, and, if, and if I could just add one more thing, Dorian, that I don't want to take for granted is is that we're all part of a team together, and we're going to all need to play a big role in making sure that we get the transportation dollars we need to be build out a system for transit and for biking and walking. So uh, we focus a lot on the, um, the details and the important bills related to biking and pedestrian. But remember, we also need to stick together for the big comprehensive package and uh, be able to get that moved through the state and your help will be critical. And, and the wonderful thing about Bike MN is we have people on the call from all over Minnesota and that I think is super important. They may not think that they have a, a role to play in St. Paul uh, or at the Capitol, but uh, if we can get a few votes from conservative uh, Republican senators from greater Minnesota or the suburbs, um, that would be uh, uh, a huge help uh, in helping Representative Bernardi and, and Chair Hornstein um, push through some funding uh, in the transportation funding omnibus bill. And uh, so. Yes, and that's such a good point. And I just wanna tell everybody, become the expert to, for your legislate, legislator on these policies and bike and pedestrian safety because you will be heard. So thank you. All right, thanks so much. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll look forward to seeing you at a committee hearing and I'll make sure that I share those uh, with everybody so they can watch, watch when we get to testify on behalf of uh, biking and walking for that omnibus bill. Thank you. All right, have a good night. Yeah. We're gonna go Bye. back to trivia and I hope you get to have a green beer sometime soon too. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Take right. care everyone. Take care, all right. Ted, take it away.